Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I live in uh, Fremont, California, and uh, I travel here, uh, as you're aware, with my passport. And I showed my ID at different stages. I had to show my credit card when I did some payments. What I'm trying to say is, you know, my identity was verified at different points while I got here. And these are my physical IDs. I also use my online IDs to kind of log into different websites, checking emails, checking my tickets, things like that. So at every point, I was using both my physical ID and my digital ID. And what we shall discover today is to how to embed trust, yeah? How to embed trust in this mobile world where your identity is verified at various stages. I'm here as part of the SD Association. Uh, the SD Association has been around since uh, the year 2000, founded by Panasonic, Toshiba, and SanDisk. And it has about 1,000 member companies. It helps develop, facilitate development of the standards, which is part of the SD card specifications. I'm a senior product manager with Identive. Identive is a global security company. We deal with providing trust in a variety of situations like premises, information, and also everyday items. And I'm also in charge of our initiative into the Internet of Things. And we do that by adding trust to even inanimate objects like toys, watches, luxury objects, cars, you name it. So come see us if you want to learn a little bit more about trusting the Internet of Things. A quick summary as to what we'll cover today. We'll start uh, with a three-pronged approach. We'll discuss where mobility is today. We'll go into a little bit into the technology portion, discuss the identity portion and the secure elements and how the SD specifications help you achieve your goals while you know, creating trust in the mobile world. And finally, we'll just look at some use cases and from the SD Association point of view, what is the call for action? Mobility, probably the fastest growing technology ever. Am I wrong on this, right? So I'm going to take to you to the year 2001, a personal space odyssey. I was leaving Chennai to go to San Francisco for the very first time in my life, right? And this happened in March 2001. Uh, any cricket lovers here? You, two, three, great. <laughs> I have an audience here, great. So this was in the middle of the Kolkata test in 2001, right? Middle, India was already following on. Lakshman and Dravid were batting. And, you know, I was making a major life change here by moving to the U.S., but this is all I was thinking of, right? I was in the plane, 24-hour ride, had no access to the scores. I was in Singapore, probably there was paid internet anywhere, somewhere there, in the airports, but you know, I, I didn't avail it. No Wi-Fi anywhere. Finally reached there, first chance I got, I got onto a computer, used dial-up, right? Got onto it, checked the scores. I was a little puzzled. It said that Dravid and Lakshman were still playing. These two gentlemen, the entire time I was traveling from here to there, had been playing. It was probably the most pivotal you know, moment in Indian cricket, and I missed the whole thing. And I was cursing technology all the time, because it wasn't there for me. But while coming here this time around, I was checking everything from you know, local scores to whatnot. I mean, people say that, are we really connected? Because I was constantly looking at my mobile phone. Our world is changing. It is changing into a connected world, if you uh, want to or not. And you can see that you know the PC market has pretty much reached a plateau. I mean, it's not gone away, but it's not growing exponentially either. We are here at a stage where there's a huge, huge growth in the mobile segment. You know, you have the uh, smartphones, and they are kind of turning into uh, phablets, like a hybrid between the tablets and the smartphones. And Internet of Things is booming, right? When you have machines talking to each other, it takes you out of the equation and allows you the luxury to do other things. And 
apparently by the year end of 2020, you'll have about 80% of users access you know, data through various shapes and sizes. Already, we see people using mobile phones for things much more than just data exchange and talking. Now, mobility in the SD. SD is the number one memory card form factor for the mobile phone environment. I mean, those of you who have uh, smartphones here in this audience today will probably have one in, inside the phone. It also has the 95% of the market share in that particular segment. And 78% of all mobile devices that are manufactured today have a micro SD uh, form factor. The second, you know, I'm kind of trying to juxtapose three different things here. I covered mobility, and I want to talk a little bit about identity. This is sort of very personal to me, right? Identity, of course, it's personal. The reason is, you know, when I left here, this was my name, B. Vijay Kumar. As you know, in Tamil Nadu, we don't have this fancy thing called last name. So I had my father's first letter of his first name as my initial, and my name Vijay Kumar. My friends know me as BV, because every class had multiple Vijay Kumars, so we were BV, SV, and TV. And when I went there, I was forced to have this thing called as a last name. I applied for my driver's license with the California DMV, and uh, the clerk joked that he was going to find me because I was taking up all the spaces in the form. At least I hope he was joking, right? I got my... And the name Balasubramanian is not that much of a linguistic challenge, but I got this unfortunate nickname, VJ blah blah blah, wherever I went. And some people even used to just refer to me as that guy with a long name. On Twitter I'm at IO things, but the best part is when I'm at Starbucks, I'm Bob. Nobody can uh, dispute that name. Lot of names for one person, confusion sometimes, you know, grievance about how my name is being treated, and identity became a passion for me. I was after securing just not my, not just my name, but overall, how do you protect your identity when everybody's ready to butcher it? You know, just kind of juxtaposed it with people who are trying to hack your identity online and things like that. Just a quick question: If you can think of usernames and passwords, how many usernames and passwords do you have today? Each person at least has apparently 17 usernames and passwords for different sites. 17. It is, and uh, have that envelope of, you know, having a lowercase, uh, uppercase combination, and asterisks, and this character, that character, length limitation. You pretty much give up, right? You hit upon one thing which you can remember, and you just replicate it all over the place. What do you think is the most common password in the world? I mean, this has been published. The word password, <laughs> exactly. And I also learned that the US Nuclear Commission, for the longest time, their password for launching nuclear missiles was 00, 00, 00, 00, 00, 00 and 00. zero. So the word, it's, it's the end of the password era. We have to move into a technology. When you say forget password and click on what your password is, I'm going to say forget your password. Move on to a technology that doesn't tie you to some legacy thing which you have to remember, right? And that's where technologies like the smart micro SD and other things come into picture. Now, we at Identiv, we believe in the single trusted identity. This is a commonplace badge that employees have world over. Now, at Identiv, we use the same credentials built into this badge for trusting your premises, you know? Tap at the door, authorize yourself, walk in. We use the same one at the desktop to enter it and possibly log on. We use it to sign our emails digitally. We use it to encrypt our emails when it's between you know, high confidential emails. We also use it to sign Adobe Acrobat uh, PDF documents. So these things, we use it every day. And this is a billion dollar market. What Identive has done is taken their know-how in this field, where we work with governments and enterprises. We have taken it into a trillion dollar market where you can add, attach the same credentials to everyday items, the Internet of Things. We are pretty much 
focused on bringing the single trusted identity to both your physical world and your digital world. And you have all these verticals where you can use it. Healthcare, banking, uh, you can use it at schools, education, shopping, cloud, you name it. Let's knuckle down and talk a little bit about the technology behind achieving all this. At the core is the secure element. And before we jump into what the secure element can do, I'm going to talk a little bit about NFC. Now, NFC has been around for quite some time. And I have been reading up the specifications, seeing what it can do. It is a proximity thing. You place something very close to an antenna range, and then things get activated, and data gets transferred. But when I'm talking about us, uh, earlier, so like 2004, 2005, when you ask people what is NFC, they would say, no freaking clue. And a little later on, we had some industry applications, and the payment industry was the first one to adopt it. But still, there were detractors. They said NFC stood for not for commerce, right? And we had to kind of think of ways to pose this technology into people's consciousness. Now we know that it stands for near field communication. And it is to the manufacturer's credit that most of your handsets today already have NFC built in. It has an antenna. The secure element interacts through NFC to the outside world. And then you have a CPU that governs all this. This is commonplace for any phone today that has NFC built into it. You can use it for card emulation. Replace your everyday cards, loyalty cards, credit cards, identity cards, using the secure element and use your mobile phone instead. Just uh, to show how I actually carry around my mobile phone, so this is how I carry it. On one side, I have the physical cards. On the other side, I have the phone. And pretty soon, I'm sure that I'll be just using one portion of it. These things are going to go away. And that's card emulation. Peer-to-peer -peer communication is from something as trivial as uh, sharing your playlists uh, to sharing confidential information to another confidant. And this might get into work soon, uh, reading and writing digital content using NFC. Tap your phone, transfer something on to something that's uh, in a public place, or receive something from there and get benefits on your phone. So these things are enabled by NFC, which is a proximity technology. A uh, very nice player in this field is the smart micro SD. Now this form factor, smart micro SD, here I'm giving free advertisement for Sandus. Uh, their smart micro micro SD, we have a booth in uh, hall 3, you can come and uh, see it in action. This form factor is ubiquitous, right? If you have a phone that has extendable storage, you'll have an SD slot. If you have a gaming station, televisions, any smart devices, they'll have an extension shot, and the 95% of the market today is held by the SD. It is a very popular uh, form factor. To have the secure element in this small factor has opened up a world of possibilities. On one side, you have the contactless services. Think of all those things that, they, that you can do just by waving your phone. This is enabled by having this smart micro SD in your phone. Think about all the secure token applications that you can do, that you're doing today, that you can replace with using your phone. Again, we have a plethora of applications, some of which we are demonstrating in Hall 3. Uh, under the SD card associations uh, ACES, and we have Identive, we have TransferJet from Sony, uh, we have Toshiba's uh, uh, demonstrations, and we also have a real world use case demonstration of how you can actually use it to unlock doors, uh, how you can actually order a cup of coffee, things like that. Now, this is a standards body. And this is a quick, like a 101 introduction into what the specification is. For those of you who do not follow the SD specifications, I would like to just point out that it is built on a solid physical layer foundation. So all the applications, all the new age technologies, they have the physical layer at the bottom, which is you know, time verified and has been used over and over in digital cameras, phones, and all. It's been tested and verified. 
And under Smart SD, you have ASSD, of which I have been a part of for quite some time. It's advanced security SD specification. And members benefit from knowing how they can use it for their own applications. And uh, we are always encouraging people to join us and help us grow this technology. Now, I'm in marketing. I took a look at it, and I was like, guys, come on. This is very clunky. You know, it's like an engineer's dream. but to show it to an audience, it's not too nice. So I took it to the marketing team. I said, I want pizzazz. You know, I want to highlight ASSD. I don't want to you know, have this cumbersome sheet. And marketing did their magic. So now you can see that ASSD is a lot more prominent. So it's supposed to be a joke. A few nice laughs will be very good. <laughs> anyway, moving on, Smart Micro SD has various variations in the market. At the far left, you have postcard emulation, and this is a great value proposition for people who are willing to adopt it without changing their infrastructure. Having a micro SD form factor already built into your phone, you just have to insert a new card, and this is a consumer-centric model, where in many countries you have fights between the telecom providers who own the SIM card and the device manufacturers who own the device. You have this third option of going into a consumer-centric model where the consumer chooses the form and what sort of security measures he wants on his card, right? And you use this, and progressively, if you, as you move from left to right, you have added technological advantages. So again, I wish to kind of under, underscore that this is the only security element form factor that does not alter whatever postcard emulation value propositions you have today. If we look at a few use cases, and uh, you know, from being tied to your desktop to having a laptop and you know, bend down and using your phone for a lot of things, to actually use the phone as a useful device to open doors, to uh, you know, have financial transactions, and apparently you get better dressed when you have NFC, uh, you can see a lot of use cases. And this is a very nice infograph that I found in the net. It talks a little bit about how India as a whole is turning into a mobile enterprise. This is for you to consume. And we have this uh, concept called uh, BYOD, which is bring your own device. And it kind of leapfrogs the whole concept of an enterprise providing you with the technology and with the uh, actual physical devices, spending money on it, and then enabling a lot of activities for you. Instead, if you and you do have smartphones today, what if that has the embedded trust that the company expects, and you can go and do a plethora of activities within your company, right? This is something that we at Identive are very, very passionate about. And this is actually a true story. Uh, I had a friend here in Chennai, and he uh, switched jobs, and this was in the same IT building uh, park, and he moved from one floor to the other floor. Uh, a weekend passed, and he had to you know, go back to his new job now. He go, gets into the elevator, uh, shows his card, and uh, goes to the floor he needs, and passes the turnstiles, gets into the building using his card, and this is all you know, muscle memory for him. He looks up from his phone and notices that he's still in his old office. You know, he's been doing this day in and day out that he didn't even realize where he was. But think of it as a security issue. Where was the chief security officer who was supposed to revoke his credentials that allowed him to do all this? And that's where if you can kind of curtail all these multiple identities into a single trusted identity through your phone or whatever that you carry. You know, one of the reasons why I switched to this case is I always used to forget my wallet when I left my home but I never used to forget my phone. So I just put them two together so that I always had them together. And if you have this, you know, everything contained in a micro SD form factor or whatever, you know, derived credential form factor that you can think of at your hand and something you wear, something you have, then it actually, you know, security officer, you can revoke credentials from the cloud. Microeconomics is again something that is in a growing stage uh, in most parts of the world. The central idea is that, you know, don't spend time working on the infrastructure. Don't set up all those banks and the financial channels that's needed to 
get across small amounts of money to the needy. Instead, have a system that works with what is already existing, that is backward compatible, right? So you ha you have the user whose requirement is basically uh, a few rupees every now and then as a loan or uh, you know as an investment. They put it back as a savings. Then there is the stock owner or the post local post office which acts as the place where the transaction happens. The bank is actually at the back end with the, does the whole ledger work digitally of what is happening. But what is going on here? There is somebody who comes in and gives something and somebody takes it and verifies it and then they pass it on to somebody else who actually does the monetary uh, transaction. It is actually a big piggy bank. And the one thing that you're doing here is verifying the identity of the person who's asking for the money or saving the money. The person who is the middleman in the transaction, his identity has to be trusted by the bank which is actually doing all this. So one common requirement here is a trusted authority that can initiate all this. So if you have a consumer centric model wherein everybody has some form of cell phone today. So if you have a consumer centric model where the user can come in, go to the store, tap in and their identity is verified and the middleman, you know, taps into the financial network, his identity is verified. This is again going to be a handheld device and the bank takes care of the transaction. So in terms of how the whole architecture works, this is how it is. You have the trusted token providers. There's a lot of business to be made there. And then you have the various institutions which are the service providers all working to the common man's benefit. Uh, all of you have seen the Android One announcement targeted primarily for market here. There are many common uh, threads across the different uh, providers. One major one is of course the price. But I would also like to point you to the memory card support where it says it can go up to 32 gigabytes and that is through micro SD today. And what if you can also have security as a sweet bonus on top of that. And you use it not just for monetary transaction, you use it for a variety of applications, right? So I think I uh, kind of covered all the necessary topics here. I'm more than happy to field questions. Yes. Yep. 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 Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, so gentlemen's question is uh, basically why NFC took such a long time to gain uh, credence in the technical world. Uh, it is two pronged actually. Uh, one is marketing, right? When you had Bluetooth, yeah, it was a name that everybody could easily talk about. And even before I knew what Bluetooth was, I fancied the name quite a bit. It was marketing gimmick, you know, there's no reason to call it a Bluetooth. But I knew about it even before I saw it in action and it was the same time period. And Bluetooth was a wireless technology which was actually slower than NFC that took, uh, you know, credence much faster. So that's marketing. Uh, the other one is primarily this is again near field communication was trying to grapple between how to differentiate itself from RFID because that was again how people were perceiving it. This is RFID, this is RFID. That's another acronym, right? To find time to differentiate itself from that acronym took some time. And I was attending all these meetings, all these things. People are talking about the specification and the technicality too much. But how do we reach it to the common man? It didn't come until much later. You know, names were thrown at it. They decided they'll call it Wave at one point. But Google quickly came up with Wave for something different. The name was out there. It is hit and miss with names. And uh, you all know about uh, Softcard, which was the first, you know, 
uh, mass adoption of NFC in payment. It was by Google uh, through their phones. They adopted it in Android and they went ahead and uh, it was uh, a consortium of companies that adopted it. But then again, at the same time they tried to do it, there was another group of companies that wanted to do it in a different way. It's where the commission goes, right? The retailers wanted it for themselves, the card issuers wanted it for themselves. So there was a divide and it was unfortunately tied to payment where everything is about dollars. So again, we had to wait till those things got resolved before we started our adoption. And now that Apple Pay is here, everybody knows NFC. Right? Everybody wants to uh, be a part of this big NFC trust. And a lot of, like, you know, you see all the jokes, you see all the cartoons. It has been in Android for years, and Apple is just doing a fantastic job of marketing it. I mean, the first time I was here, my colleague knows this very well, we had built an MP3 player in 2000 in Chennai. And we did it in a con connection with Roxio and all that. We didn't sell anything, right? People. The concept of putting MP3 uh, songs in your in your handheld device was just not taking off, and we had a very neat concept too. We went up to the uh, stage where we can actually listen to the songs. It took some while, but I, I when I was uh, going on the highway uh, just outside of the Apple campus, you know, there was like a hundred foot long guitar there. That was all. It was a poster. It said, "iPod is coming." You know, I was like. There's a marketing here. I mean, I have one in my, you know, uh, bag right now. And these guys were just, they blew away the competition like anything with just, just their marketing. And iPod became synonymous with MP3 players. And we can't even imagine any other MP3 player today, the way they launched it. Another brilliant marketing tactic, they tied it with iTunes, right? Now people were paying 99 cents for one song, but they were making millions out of the albums. So it's all marketing and business acumen that actually pushed it. And you know, for the longest time, Apple held back on NFC because they wanted to do something their own way. That also contributed to it. Because every time we had discussions about NFC, immediately the customers were like, what, what about Apple? And we would be like, hey, look out of the window. Did you see that? And things like that. We used to distract them. We didn't have an answer. But now we can at least say that, you know, Apple is embracing it for payment. They'll soon open it up for other applications. Yes. We can look forward in the going forward whether it would come down to handset selling about 5,000 or about US dollar 100. What kind of pricing are you looking at going forward? Yeah, I can talk to it a little bit. So, Apple Pay and NFC are not exactly different. So, Apple Pay is NFC, they use NFC technology. What Apple has done is basically uh, instead of your Android phone today, when you say it's NFC enabled, that it's actually a reader writer. So you can actually uh, transfer data both from your phone to the outside world and also take data into uh, your uh, phone. So it's both a reader as well as a writer. Apple today is just a tag. A tag is basically a radio uh, RFID element where you can actually read stuff. It doesn't work the other way around. So the, it can be active tag, you can write to it, but Apple has made a closed circuit uh, implementation of NFC here. So instead of having a reader writer, what they have essentially treating their phone is as a tag. And they've done it in a typical Apple way, right? They want to control everything that happens so that it is a success from day one. You have the secure element, same way we have a secure element in the micro SD. They have, there is a secure element devoted in the Apple phone. And if you have a credit card today with supported banks, your credit card number will be paired up with a private key that is stored in the secure element. So there's that pairing is maintained by Apple and the banks. Banks, I don't know if they'll know the private key, but it is stored by Apple uh, in the iCloud or wherever. And it's not something that they just have a visible look at it. It is in an encrypted format. When you use your iPhone for payments, your credit card number never goes into the transaction. It is only the unique key that is in the secure element that goes up. So that way your credit card details never actually take part in the transaction, right? And 
for every session, you have the private key that generates a session key and it could it makes use of a thumbprint, you know, the touch ID that's in the Apple iPhone. So it's a two-factor authentication of who you are. Again, your identity is being verified with your thumbprint there. And even if somebody intercepts that particular transaction, it is useless because they can't use it again because it's a session key and uh, they don't have your thumb to uh, use it. That is Apple's model. Why it has kind of caused a panic among retailers is they don't make commission out of this, any of this. So, you know, for the traditional credit card business, it's all about commission. Every time you swipe your card, somebody makes some money there. But if you tap your phone, Apple is making the money, nobody else is making the money. So, I hope I answered your question. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So for the, I'm going to sidestep and talk about the smart micro SD again. So I'm saying smart micro SD is a consumer centric model. So the affordability really depends on your need for security there. So I showed you three different models. One is the basic postcard emulation model, which is of course offered by uh, like an off the shore thing. You can pick up the uh, smart micro SD off a shelf, put it in your phone and start using it. And it gives you a host card emulation because Android 4.4 today already has HCE as part of its uh, DNA. If you want to start adding other elements to it, for example, I talked about advanced security. You are combining it with NFC. And for those things, it's a value proposition model. It really depends on your application. For a retail kind of a model, the cost is not too high. You're already using a smart micro SD today. You're just using it for a, something other than just storing your pictures and your videos. And, but if you go into enterprise and government applications, where you have to have a handshake to kind of determine who you are, and then the handshake has to be uh, logged in and stored, then you go in for the higher price models. I, I, I don't know about the price models yet because it's an evolving uh, technology. But uh, suffice to say that it is whoever is able to afford expendable memory can actually invest in this. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Yes. So what, what do you do when you go and withdraw money? If, if in a typical ATM, you use your Mac stripe, right? The ATM sucks in your card, and then you punch in possibly a four digit pin that is unique to you. It matches it with the card, and then you take whatever money you have in your uh, account, right? Now, the physical components are basically the card and the pin you type in. And what NFC uh, is doing with Smart Micro SD is that it is putting that into a secure element, which is far more secure. I mean, even if you lose your phone today, you have the Find My Phone and all those features, you can actually cancel your card. Nobody will be able to use the uh, uh, credit card details that are built in. And like I said, the credit card number is never takes uh, part in the transaction. It is only the highly secure data that is encrypted and stored inside that is being used. So that's how actually that works. So very quickly, uh, I think we have had a small primer on the technology itself and uh, your decision makers, uh, IT managers, business managers, you must be thinking about ways to implement this in your business, right? How will it benefit me? But there is a small step in between you know, there is no miracle that is going to happen from step one to step three. Step two is to actually learn more about it. So it is my uh, sincere wish that you come visit us. We are in uh, part of the SD Association, uh, Hall 3, uh, A61, I think. I hope it's not some other booth, but please do find us and we'll talk in depth about what your needs are and how we can help you. Thanks a lot.